I'm joined by my colleague uh, Rachel Lovesley, Lovesley from uh, Northampton General Hospital as well. So we're going to be doing a bit of ping pong with the slides and uh, <laughs> sharing, presenting them. Like I say, this is something that we've uh, we've done together. Uh, just wanted to say thank you. It's uh, always fantastic to be shortlisted for a penna and it's um, such a tough category. Some of the other things that we've seen are an absolutely amazing piece of work that have been undertaken. So thank you so much and I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Rachel. Great, thank you, James. Can I have our next slide, please? So for those of you that um, aren't aware, um, we have Kettering General Hospital and Northampton General Hospital within Northamptonshire. Um, and previously we have worked very independently um, of each other, serving the population of Northamptonshire. But earlier this year, the decision was made that actually there is strength in collaboration and we became a group model. Now I need to emphasize this is not a merger, it's very much a collaboration and that has opened up lots of new opportunities for us in terms of working together and the way that we run our services um, and do all the things that we do to make things the best that they can be for our patients. So that really has been uh, the catalyst for the development of the patient engagement model and I'll take you through that now. Can I have my next slide please? So where did this come from? So as soon as we knew that we were going to become a group model, we um, began the co-production of our mission, vision and values because it was really important to us that staff and patients were involved in developing what was it that we were aiming to do through this new group model. You know, we don't do these things just for the sake of it, it's to achieve something and that was really important to us. And James and I were heavily involved in that work and ensuring that patients were also um, involved so that opened up lots of new doors for us and one of the things that we identified straight away was that there were going to be some reviews to clinical pathways so that we could work between um, both of the hospitals and ensure that the pathways were the best that they could be and we had a team approach us um, for ear nose and throat so ENT services who wanted to make sure that they were co-producing their new um, clinical pathway which had previously had some quite significant issues so we worked with the team but it became clear really quickly that actually as a team they weren't 100% sure on how to do this and they needed some guidance, they needed some kind of process to follow and we realised that actually this was going to be a, quite a common occurrence that we would be reviewing all of these um, different pathways across the um, group model so we needed to develop something that people could follow. So we worked with our patient and family partners who are our patient representatives to look at um, all the different stages of a project and where patients should be being involved. Now obviously it's throughout but we needed to be a bit more specific because just telling people you should be involving patients throughout it just wasn't enough um, and obviously this was all about patients being that golden thread. So James is going to take you through the different steps of the um, patient engagement model and what it actually looks like like in action. Thank you. Um, so we've broken down the patient engagement model into uh, two phases. Uh, the phase one approach really is about setting the scene and looking from points one to five at actually what is it, what is the issue? Uh, what are the services that are being reviewed and, and why? And documenting that so we can share with patients to, to look at review and support us with. Now, we faced a, a challenge in terms of trying to engage with already established groups because we couldn't find any. And the patients that we currently engage with, there was no recent experience that could share or, or be involved in um, this project specifically. Uh, so we actually created our own focus group. Um, we, we wrote to 400, I think it was Rachel, um, ENT, uh, patients who had used the service and we worked with IG colleagues to make sure that we could do that under GDPR and um, we created our own focus group. So Rachel mentioned our patient and family partners. We have that across both organisations. It's something we've replicated over here at KGH to pool all of our resources together and um, we've involved them throughout the whole process. So jump into step three really it was about looking at the current service and where the failings are and actually where does that marry up with uh, other data that we have to to our hands you know uh, that is available to us um 
and really it showed straight away and highlighted where the issues were. Um, as part of that, we actually identified some patient stories as well. And steps four and five are interchangeable within the process. But for us and our PFPs, our patient and family partners, they thought that this was the best way for it to be presented and to flow through the journey. Our um, patient groups were um, the, the people that kind of scrutinised this, the whole project. Every step of the way, they were kept informed and we kept feeding back to them. And um, one of the things that we found really beneficial was actually establishing a real-time survey to see what patients going through the journey here and now were telling us about the service as well in terms of the ear, nose and throat. Um, we had some really insightful feedback from our focus group. Like I say, we didn't have something that we could go to. There were other um, support networks out there, but nothing specific to ENT. None of our patient and family partners had recent, recent experience, so we decided to create that. And um, we now have somebody who's going to be on the project group moving forward for the phase two approach. So like I say, uh, phase one is really about setting the scene. Why are we here? What's going on? What's the purpose? And trying to establish where the groups are already that you can engage with that have recent experience of the services. Um, Step seven and eight really is around actually what's the here and now, looking at the real time feedback as opposed to historical data and taking that forth and looking at step eight where you can um, engage with those groups and, and take it further. So next slide, please, I'll take you on to phase two. So phase two really is about the topping and tailing and actually closing the loop. So there is a middle bit and that's where we're currently at with our ENT project at the moment and um, we're going into phase two so it's going to be really useful to be able to follow this um, after the the initial review gathering the information pulling together all the data packs and looking at historical data and then reviewing the implementation process this is actually looking at the other side so once the new model is launched once the new pathway is in place for example when once things have been revised is it working and how does that look now from a patient's perspective? So again, it's about reviewing the data and themes. What are our FFT results telling us? What are our complaints and PALS themes telling us? And what are any local surveys telling us as well as patient stories? The most important thing that we found was really about um, when we have a new pathway and we have feedback and comments about it, it's about mapping that feedback against the pathway and gives you something really visual. It's something our patients found really useful and uh, of benefit, as did the program managers as well. So once the um, you've done that, you've collected and you've remapped the process, it's about going back to those groups that you've worked with. So we now have a list of patients that would like to be involved from the first focus group to go back to, to say, this is the new process, this is how it's worked, and this is the feedback we've had, but also actually engaging with patients that come through the service and use the new pathway as they go through as well. Um, communication is key. We know that communication is a theme across pretty much every survey that we get we know that it's always a theme along uh, pals concerns and complaints so for us this is a sense check and for the people that we've involved in developing it it's it's something that they own and we want to review on an ongoing basis um like it says there at the very end communication is uh, key to meaningful and successful engagement allowing time to discuss things uh, allowing time for discussions to take place um, really closing the loop and feeding back and then not just forgetting about it but re revisiting revising and making sure that things are still on track and um, it's a benefit to patients fab thank you james um, and james has covered some of this already but in terms of actually testing this so putting this into practice how is it actually going to work and um, we very much did that we used ent as our our pilot really for that so um, i won't go into too much detail but as james said we collected all historical data we created a pack that was based on powell's complaints fft all that historical data, just as Louisa said in the chat, it's really important actually to um, gather all that information that you already have. Um, we involved our patient experience groups that, that are exec led from the beginning, so this had real um, high level buy-in. 
we established real-time surveys to collect the here and now. Um, we wrote up to 400 current patients and invited them to be part of the project, held focus group. Um, that was excellent. And that was our chance to really map that current pathway and look at where those issues were. And then um, again, further invite, invite the um, members of that focus group to share their stories. And we collected digital stories. We did graphical representation of stories. And we were also able to do graphical representations of um, the issues that were identified and how they were overcome. So as a really quick example, um, the patients that were emergency um, patients at one of the hospitals, when they arrived there, there was no provision of ENT services that had to make their own way over to the other hospital within the um, county. The issue with that was that they'd then get to A&E and need to be re-triaged and they just did not like that. We, and obviously, I don't think any of us would. You're going through A&E twice. So we that was immediately picked up through um, the patient engagement activities and that was resolved as part of the new pathway and there's lots of different examples of that that we can then share back to our engagement group and say you know you said this and this is what we've done to make sure that we overcome that. So we have identified learning from our ENT project and we're going to implement that moving forward with the various other clinical collaborations that are due to take place. Um, like I said with the ENT we didn't have patients identified at the beginning because we didn't have them uh, that we could make contact with. It's about making sure we do that from the very beginning and, and involving patients uh, from the offset. We have now got a patient on our project group. Um, don't assume that project managers know how to engage with patients is, is a big one for us and being realistic on timescales. And um, we've touched on some of the other things about moving forward. We've had some lovely feedback and I think, you know, obviously, hopefully this will be available um, afterwards, but the Jamie John was our project lead that we worked with. And then um, Howard was one of our patient and family partners who actually developed it with us. And obviously they say some really nice things about um, the development of it and the piloting of it. But yeah, it's been really successful.